Hey, this is Dave Page. I have a story to tell you. My dad, Bob Page, was a beloved instrumental music teacher, choral director, minister of music, composer, and an arranger. Well, after he passed away, I was going through some of his boxes and such, and I came across this uh, little booklet from 1930 on the instruments of the modern orchestra and band. On the left page is the text on a particular instrument, and on the opposite page is a photograph of the instrument in use. Well, glancing through it, I became aware of just how unknowledgeable I was in regards to the instruments of the modern orchestra and band, as of 1930 anyway. Among the several I had never heard of was the heckle phone. I mean, what the heck? Go ahead and say it. I sure did. Well, I knew the saxophone was named for its Belgian inventor, Adolf Sax. So, was there a guy named Heckle? Terrible! Awful! I hated it! No, not Heckle. Heckle. Sure enough, you bassoonists will likely know the name Wilhelm Heckel. It's a long-established woodwind manufacturer based in Wiesbaden, best known for their quality bassoons. Well, it seems composer Richard Wagner yeah, yeah that guy, visited with Herr Heckel around 1880 and proposed the idea of an instrument to fill the gap between the oboe and the bassoon. Well, the first hecophone was produced around 1904, and only about 150 were made. Today it is estimated that there are about a hundred or so around the world, making this a fairly rare breed. So Dave, what does this have to do with the music from Star Trek? Well, I thought you'd never ask. I will sum it up in one name, Alexander Courage. Well, born in Philadelphia, December 10th, 1919, to a Scottish father and a French-American mother, Alexander Courage grew up in New Jersey, where he studied the piano, and the French horn. In 1941, he earned his music degree from the Eastman Conservatory in Rochester, New York. His friends called him Sandy. Well, right out of school, and remember what was happening in 1941? He enlisted in the United States Army Air Forces and was stationed at March Field in Riverside, California as a band leader warrant officer. Here he gained experience in dramatic scoring for Army radio programs. Well, networking was as important then as it is today. The wife of an Army buddy happened to be a copyist at CBS who introduced him to the right people and after his military service he became an orchestrator and arranger at MGM Studios. While he was at MGM, Mr. Courage worked on such films as Showboat, Hot Rod Rumble, The Bandwagon, Gigi, and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. As a sample of his arranging and orchestration skill, check out this clip from the Barn Raising Dance. Now, while the dancing is incredible, try to listen closely to Courage's music, if you can.
Courage was a master orchestrator, having worked scores composed by the likes of Andre Previn, Adolf Deutsch, John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith. He composed several film scores of his own and then moved into television around 1959, working on shows like Daniel Boone, uh, The Brothers Brannigan, Lost in Space, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, and The Waltons. Now, remember at the start of this video, we were talking about the heckle phone? Do you suppose they have any life on other planets? What do you care? You don't have any life on this one. <laughs> we're not quite there yet, but let's now take a look at some of his work for Star Trek. Mr. Courage had gotten to know a man named Wilbur Hatch during his time at MGM. Hatch went on to be head of music at Desilu Studios, where Star Trek was to be produced. It was Bill Hatch who recommended Sandy Courage to Gene Roddenberry for his upstart sci-fi TV show. And now, nearly six decades later, just about everyone knows that the name Alexander Courage is synonymous with but more than that well-known fanfare and theme song he scored all the music for both series pilot shows The Cage and Where No Man Has Gone Before as well as the episodes The Naked Time and The Man Trap and in season three, he wrote scores for The Enterprise Incident and Plato's Stepchildren. Okay, at long last, let's get to the heckle phone. When I started researching for this series of videos, <clears throat> I found a gold mine in Jeff Bond's 1999 book, The Music of Star Trek. Pages 37 and 38 list all the musical cues from the first pilot, The Cage, along with their running time and orchestral breakdown. First item shown is the main title. Look at the instruments in the orchestra. The third instrument mentioned, the heckle phone. It is misspelled in the book. It should be C-K-E-L and not L-E, but I digress. Now look again the next cue, and the next, and the next. All but seven of these musical cues feature that danged heckle phone. Well, Mr. Courage clearly thought that this rarely heard instrument could bring a certain alien sound to his music and establish an otherworldly quality. <laughs> No, not that. Remember, it was to fill the gap between the oboe and the bassoon. Although the name may sound funny to American ears, the tone produced by this instrument is nothing less than astounding. It's a beautiful member of the double reed family with a conical bore and a wide reed, more like that of a bassoon. It is played in concert pitch and has identical fingering to the oboe, but it sounds an octave lower. Let's audition one. I found this clip of Katrin Stubel with the Stuttgart Orchestra. I hope you're sitting down. Now, remember Vina's dance? 
from the cage menagerie? Mr. Courage achieved an exotic sound and feel that was both accessible to our ear, yet strangely extraterrestrial at the same time. See if you can pick out the heckle phone in the lower registers. <laughs> place you have here, Mr. Pike. Vina? Well, we can deeply appreciate a professional like Sandy Courage in knowing just what instruments to draw from in order to convey the heart of the story in music. Much of Mr. Courage's music was, of course, reused in many other episodes. In a different video, we discussed the practice of tracking, which allowed TV producers of the day to reuse recorded music so long as it was within the same production season. Well, this brings us to... Okay, here's a mashup of the music cue True Love from The Cage when a vulnerable Vina tells Captain Pike, I can't help but love you. And then two later instances that use the same music as a tracked cue. Check it out. Like a, a wild little animal. I'm beginning to see why none of this has worked for you. You've been home, and uh, fighting is on Rigel. That's not new to you either. A person's strongest dreams are about what he can't do. Yes, a ship's captain, always having to be so formal, so decent and honest and proper. You must wonder what it would be like to forget all that. So, take it easy. Sit down. What happened? You're wonderful. You're the sweetest, friendliest people in the universe. It's paradise, my friend. Paradise. Lieutenant O'Neill, where is he? Paradise. The music written for Star Trek was generally of such high quality and sophistication that a library of cues was established, and these would be re-recorded for the new season per requirements of the Musicians' Union. Even if this pushed a recording session into overtime, it was still money well spent. In this next example, a brief quote from some of Courage's earliest music written for Star Trek is found years later. This music cue from the cage is called the kibitzers. It's a Yiddish word for an uninvited spectator to some social or gaming event. While Captain Pike and crew are greeting the supposed survivors on Talos IV, from deep underground, the Keeper and other Talosians are secretly watching.
Okay, late in the third season, on March 14, 1969, NBC aired the next to last Star Trek episode, number 78, All Our Yesterdays, in which an entire population of a doomed world had escaped their destruction by retreating into its past. Now, in a sense, hearkening back to the show's past, that tracked cue, the kibitzers, makes one last brief appearance in this scene between Zarabeth and Mr. Spock. A very inventive mind, that man. But insensitive. To send such a beautiful woman into exile. Cold must have affected me more than I realized. Please pay no attention. I'm not myself. Well, fortunately for us, life for Alexander Courage didn't end with Star Trek. He went on to work on such classics as Dr. Doolittle, Fiddler on the Roof, The Poseidon Adventure, Superman, and how about Jurassic Park? In 1988, he won an Emmy Award for his music direction on the television special, Julie Andrews, The Sound of Christmas. He rejoined the Star Trek universe in the 1990s with his work on Star Trek, First Contact, and Generations. He would often collaborate with John Williams during the latter's Boston Pops tenure. After years of failing health, Maestro Courage passed away May 15, 2008, in Pacific Palisades, California. At his memorial, John Williams recalled their first meeting in a 1956 recording session at Capitol Records and how Courage had made some influential recommendations that helped kickstart Williams' illustrious career. He called Sandy Courage a fantastic artist, craftsman, and connoisseur. He loved sports cars, cigars, and life. And he added, I feel so honored and privileged to have been Sandy's friend and colleague. 